Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. We're really excited today to uh, have folks join us and dig into a pretty timely and topical subject. Uh, my name is Kevin Petrie. I'm VP of Research here at Eckerson Group. I'll be your host, your MC today. We designed these CDO tech vents, Chief Data Officer tech vents, to give you all the information you need to buy emerging technologies and implement them effectively. Today our topic is data sharing and data marketplaces. This event is taking place because of our sponsors, so I want to quickly recognize our sponsors, our partners who help make this event possible. Our gold tier vendor partners are Dawex, Informatica, and Revelate. Our silver tier vendor partners are Crux and Narrative. We also have media partners who help promote the event and bring all of you here, for which we're very grateful. These include uh, Real-Time Insights, or RT Insights, and CD Insights. They include Bark, Datanami, and Solutions Review. So very excited. Before handing over to Wayne, I'll tell you a little bit about us. I think a lot of you know us, but for those who don't, we are a boutique research consulting and advisory firm. We specialize in data analytics. So we have a consulting division. This is what Rain runs. And we work with a lot of enterprises, mid-sized and large, to help them create enterprise data strategies, design modern data architectures, implement and optimize data governance programs, and develop self-service strategies that actually work. So we encourage you, practitioners, data leaders, to contact us if you'd like to learn more. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to our founder, Wayne Eckerson, and he's going to take things away teaching you a little bit more about data marketplaces and data sharing. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, it's great to be here with all of you and our vendor and media partners. A little bit of an agenda for this keynote. It's actually a three-part keynote. I'm going to give you an overview of data marketplaces for about 15 minutes. And then we've got two practitioners here, people who have implemented data marketplaces, and I'll interview them. Uh, Dovek uh, Kodalupi of After Eyes and Eric Robel of CoreLogic. And then we'll come back to finish my keynote where I'll talk to you about the products and share with you a short list and evaluation criteria. And then right after we finish here, start the technology panel and uh, probably won't have time for questions during the keynote. So save your questions for the panel. We'll have plenty of time there. I think there are four generations of data architecture. Uh, and many of us have lived through most of these. In the seventies and eighties, it was operational reporting where users queried uh, operational systems directly. In the 90s uh, was the advent of business intelligence where users queried a data warehouse that normalized data from multiple internal systems, mostly structured data. Uh, in the 2010s, we witnessed the advent of big data and big data analytics where now users query either a data lake or a data warehouse that pulls in all kinds of data, both internal and external, uh, you know, transactional data, interaction data, such as, um, you know, website clicks and observational data from social media and maybe IoT devices out in the field. So today, I think we're witnessing another generational change in the data architecture, and I think this is data marketplaces. Now, if you see from this diagram, it looks something that's also very, like something that's also very popular today, which is a data mesh architecture. And indeed a data marketplace is really uh, an externalized data mesh. But the one thing a data mesh, whether it's internal or external is missing is a data marketplace, essentially a vehicle by which these different data domains or in an external world, different companies can actually exchange, find and exchange information and data products. The other difference here is that where these data marketplaces are really optimized to ingest and distribute external data in the form of data products. So uh, as we've moved and evolved through our data architectures, uh, we continue to add more data, more volumes of data, more types of data to enrich the data that we can use to deliver better and uh, deeper insights to the business. So what are the drivers behind this marketplace slash mesh environment? Marketplace being the kind of the, the application layer for a data mesh, uh, the missing component that no one's really talking about in the data mesh. Well, one big driver is that there is a data gold rush going on. So this is a quote from Accenture. 
By 2030, over 1 million organizations worldwide shall monetize their data assets, unlocking more than $3.6 trillion in value. So that kind of assumes that every enterprise is sitting on, that's sitting on data might monetize their data. Uh, it's not going to be quite as easy as that, I think. We're going to see traditional data aggregators and data providers lead the way in monetizing data. Uh, and we're seeing a kind of an avalanche of new data providers who are acquiring data from all over the place uh, and making that available in these data marketplaces. Uh, there are a lot of also data markets places that support data ecosystems. It could be a country ecosystem, a regional ecosystem, a city ecosystem. Uh, and the marketplace is designed to bring all these players together around the data that that ecosystem generates and wants to share. We'll give you some more examples of that. In fact, our practitioners are doing just that. So internal to companies, there are a lot of things that are driving the need for external data and pushing companies to go find marketplaces in which to buy that data. So data science projects, customer 360 initiatives, data clean rooms, which are increasingly important as vendors and, and browsers stop supporting cookies, which is how digital marketers have always enriched their data. And of course, competitive intelligence where organizations need to look outside their own boundaries and find out what their competitors are doing and what are the significant trends driving their marketplace. So let me stop. What is a data marketplace? So here's an easy definition. It's a website or cloud data platform that enables data providers and data consumers to exchange or share data in a frictionless manner. So you can see here that providers consume data from multiple data sources, both their own and perhaps external to themselves. They turn them into data products that are available for data consumers to search, browse, and discover in that marketplace, and then pull that data into their own internal business systems. So the terminology we use here is, is important because there is a lot of confusion. For instance, data providers and data consumers, if there's actually a transaction, a commercial transaction involved, we might change that names to data sellers and data buyers, but not all marketplaces support commercial transactions or they allow commercial transactions that happened outside of the marketplace to be executed within the marketplace. Uh, so in other words, the money is kept out of the marketplace, but the data is distributed within it. Another player in this uh, marketplace environment are the data operators. And they're the people who buy the technology that runs the marketplace. And they operate the marketplace on behalf of the data sellers and the data buyers. And what they're buying to do this is what we're calling a data exchange platform. Now, to be honest, the terms data marketplace, data exchange, and data hub sometimes are used interchangeably here. But for Eckerson Group, we've decided the marketplace really is the application that's sitting on top of the data exchange technology uh, that can also support a type of marketplaces called hubs. And we'll get into that in a second. So, a couple of other things, data products. No one today knows what a data product is, but once you implement a data marketplace or use a data marketplace, it's pretty darn obvious what a data product is. It's really anything that can be packaged up, uh, described and put out for consumption and download or querying by uh, other people or other groups. So a data product could, usually it's a data set, but it could also be a query, it could be a machine learning model, it could be a notebook, could be a report, really any data asset that you can package up, use metadata to describe and provide access to it for folks to download or use, sometimes consume just in place. Then transactions can be free, as we mentioned, or they can be executed outside of the marketplace. Inside the marketplace, you could be paying you know, per download or per usage of an asset. You could be paying for these data assets or products on a subscription basis. Uh, you could have purchased them outside the marketplace and received a token that works within the data marketplace to unlock the data that you bought. Or uh, as I say, it could be free or, and usually it's a multiple, multiple versions of these things exist, uh, coexist together inside of a marketplace. Actual physical exchange of data or assets is done in many different ways. 
uh, mark, good marketplaces support multiple ways to distribute data through SFTP, API, cloud buckets. Increasingly, we're seeing companies build sophisticated data pipelines to ingest external data from marketplaces or even from marketplace providers themselves to use sophisticated data pipelines to bring data into uh, their seller hub, which they then turn into products. And then the newest technology is data sharing. It's been popularized by Snowflake and now data, Databricks, where no data actually is copied or moved. It's just point, you know, you just receive essentially pointers and access to the data. Uh, access can be public. In other words, everyone and anyone is invited to join this marketplace. It could be private, only available to members or people who have paid to access the marketplace. Or it could be permissioned. And in fact, in any public or private marketplace, access to the physical or the actual data products is granted on a per buyer basis, right? So every seller has the opportunity to, to determine who can access their data products and who cannot. All right, and then finally, types of data marketplaces. Uh, we've talked about external data marketplaces. This is a many-to-many -many environment. So there's many data providers and many data consumers all meeting together in this marketplace um, to exchange data and perhaps buy and sell it. The flip side of that is an internal data marketplace, still many data providers and consumers, but all happens inside of an organization. And this is where data mesh is playing right now. And a marketplace I think is, is absolutely needed to support those data mesh type environments. Two other types of marketplaces. One is a buyer hub. Instead of many to many, this is one to many. So it's one big buyer with many suppliers. So think of like Walmart. Or Kroger's or US government. Uh, those would be buyer hubs using the same technology, but focused on ingesting data for their own purposes. The flip side of that is a seller hub where you have one big seller selling to many buyers. So traditionally, data brokers are data sellers and they're trying to attract, using the new technology that we have today, uh, lots of different data buyers for their content. So if we drill down on external data marketplaces, there are many types of these. So you have a global data marketplace, anybody selling to anybody else, any type of data, right? Uh, but we're starting to see the emergence of country data marketplaces focused on an individual country, regional data marketplaces, city data marketplaces. We see a lot of industry-based data marketplaces focused on a specific industry or a consortium within the industry. Uh, there are a lot of open data marketplaces, and sometimes there are spe data specific marketplaces. So some examples, uh, there is called the Japan Data Exchange. That's a country uh, marketplace. There's the Shanghai Data Exchange, so that's a municipal one. There's the Space Data Marketplace, that's focused on a specific type of data, satellite data. Uh, Ag Data Hub is an industry-based marketplace focused on agriculture. Uh, and then CoreLogic Discovery is an industry-based marketplace focused on housing data for the U.S. market. And AfterEyes is uh, an industry-based marketplace focused on uh, aftermarket parts for the auto industry. Those last two are bolded here because those are the companies our practitioners come from. So you'll hear a lot more about those two marketplaces in a second. So who provides data exchange platforms right in the middle of this diagram? These are the core vendors that we've identified to this point. I think we'll see a lot more going forward. Now, some of these vendors have also decided to operate their own external data marketplace. And those are listed here. So you can either just offer the software essentially for others to buy and operate and implement their own data marketplaces and or you can Use that same software to operate your own marketplace as Amazon, DAOX, Google, Microsoft, Narrative, Snowflakes, and soon Databricks will be doing. So the evolution of data marketplaces, in the 1990s, we had data brokers uh, essentially selling data and giving it to you in the form of CDs. You guys remember that and you get a monthly CD in the mail. Uh, then it evolved to FTP and APIs. These exchanges were really fraught with all kinds of problems. The data quality was suspect. The schema often changed unannounced. Uh, flexible licensing, the data delivery was unreliable. 
so everything was difficult about getting data or buying data uh, in the 1990s and beyond. Just recently in, in 2020, we started seeing a few vendors like Dogs, Amazon, Snowflake start to introduce a more modern type of marketplace uh, with basic features to facilitate the buying and sharing of data products. Uh, and they are now moving all this to the cloud. But just in the last two years, we've seen vendors go beyond these bread um, or plain vanilla data marketplaces and offer what I would call data value change. And the whole purpose there is to make uh, the exchange of data between providers and consumers frictionless. So offer services that support frictionless creation, licensing, discovery, evaluation, purchasing, ingestion, and integration of data products. And oftentimes there are the data is delivered using custom data pipelines or data sharing technology. So benefits for the, the, these new data value chain type of marketplaces, you know, to consumers or buyers, uh, stop shopping. Uh, increasingly, you can go one place to get all the data you need, all the products you want. You can also increasingly see before you buy, sometimes the entire data set. Uh, and you can evaluate that data for quality and completeness, and then even filter that data and purchase just what you want. Uh, oftentimes, these tools allow a team or a company to set up a team with an administrator and buyers and then give budgets to each of the buyers so people aren't out there willy-nilly buying products uh, from all different kinds of marketplaces. You can actually manage the purchase of external data. And increasingly, the uh, marketplaces deliver data in a very targeted way to the customer's desired endpoint in the format that's required. So that's different. For our providers or sellers, um, the tools make it so much easier to onboard, acquire and onboard data, to create a multiplicity of data products from that data uh, and to publish those products. Uh, it uh, gives sellers flexible access controls and licensing so they can define who actually can see which of these products and who can't. Uh, it can define terms of use of that, you know, how long they can use it, for what purpose they can use it or not use it. Can they derive data from that data or not? Uh, these marketplaces also automate the delivery of that data. It's no longer a manual process where someone has to push a button over, a, you know, to move data over an FTP site. Uh, the marketplaces create these data pipelines that push data on an automated basis. Many of them have uh, apps, um, app marketplaces running on top of them that offer a variety of enrichment services, such as tools that allow you to evaluate the quality of supplier data, uh, to receive alerts when new data is published that might meet your needs, uh, and so on. For data operators, here's a turnkey system, really, to support the ecosystem of your choice foster greater collaboration among all parties in your ecosystem, make sure that what they publish complies with regulations, and as a result, builds trust and cooperation within the players in the ecosystem, strengthening that ecosystem and making it more competitive, both with um, the collaboration that happens and the insights that can be gained from the usage of all this information. So before I turn it over to our practitioners, just a few market trends. So today, most buyers skew heavily towards the financial services industry. Um, and a lot of enterprises, you know, before they try to monetize data, they really need to sort out legal and security issues. So I think what we'll see from most enterprises or buyers um, outside of financial services and even inside is that they will start to build an internal marketplace first. And then once they have that, uh, they might take those products in the internal marketplace and turn those inside out uh, and share those on a public marketplace. For sellers, we're seeing an explosion of sellers looking to cash in on this data gold rush. Uh, and most are using this new technology that I've been describing to build value added storefronts, data storefronts, to make it easier to attract and retain buyers basically upping their game with this new cloud-based, often SaaS-based technology. And most are using the global data marketplaces like those that we saw that the tech companies are operating like Amazon, really as a marketing channel for their bare bones products. And it's a way to, to encourage vendors to come visit them at their own storefronts. 
which offer a lot more services than the plain vanilla marketplaces. And for operators, we're seeing, uh, as I said earlier, they're building marketplaces in every type of niche out there, uh, supporting a variety of ecosystems. But it can be challenging to achieve a tipping point with enough buyers and sellers. So that's always a challenge. Uh, and for the tech players who are offering their own marketplaces, sometimes they're doing it as a checkbox requirement to keep up with the, with the crowd. So with that, I want to turn to our first practitioner, uh, uh, Ludovic Kurlupi, who's the business data lead at After Eyes. And uh, just a little background on After Eyes. Uh, uh, it's a brand new data marketplace started mo by Mobivia, Europe's leading provider of aftermarket parts, repair services, and mobility services, including bike sharing services. Uh, after Eyes brings together all the players in the automotive aftermarket, including spare parts suppliers, auto manufacturers, repair shops, insurance companies, and banks who are interested in analyzing purchasing data, car repair data, customer loyalty data, and product usage data, among other things. So really supporting this ecosystem of this specific industry. So uh, Ludo, welcome. And, uh, Thank you. Yeah, maybe you could share with us a little bit more about After Eyes and Mobivia. Yeah, no problem. So thanks, Wayne, also for this introduction. So, so After Eyes, it's a, a new data marketplace that we created one year ago. Uh, we are in uh, in Geneva. We are located in Geneva, Switzerland. And in fact, we at this stage we have only two person in After Eyes, but maybe in the future, it depends on their growth. Uh, will be more and more people inside. And then we are now over 30 companies registered in, in, into, into the, our data marketplace. But let's say that after rise, as you, you also explained, it's a data marketplace specialized in the automotive and mobility aftermarket and belong to Mobilia Group. And I don't want to go in details because you have the figures in front of you, but we are the first independent retailer in Europe and we have many, many, many brands uh, that is well known in Europe, maybe not well known in US, but uh, we, we, we say that we are uh, over 50 million of customers. So we can imagine that we have a lot of data to share or to valorize, let's say. Yep. Great. Uh, well, so maybe you could explain a little bit more about how you started uh, After Eyes uh, and what it consists of. In fact, Let's say that we have a long belief that selling our, um, our data can be a key success factor for, the, for, for our business in the future. But to do so, we need to think a little bit and to explain when and how uh, we build uh, after us. First, we identify uh, a partner that is direct and we done with them a data exchange advisory. This step, it's very important to understand the, the data product, to understand the market, and to understand also the potential of your data. To create at the end a business plan to be sure that when we present to the, to the top management, they'll be ready to say, okay, it's interesting to go in this way and, to, and go to the data marketplace. But then when we start this new activity, let's say that we have only one seller, it's Mobivia. So if we come back to your framework, Wayne, just we, because we, we saw it in, in the, some slides ago, we said that there is a draft. And then we can, on the beginning, the strategy will be first one seller, many, many buyer. Okay? Because we have only the Mobivia in, uh, data that to, to put on this marketplace. But then, thanks to Derex, we also... Uh, learn that we can be an orchestrator of, of a business, of a data marketplace. And then with the strategy evolve in an external data marketplace, many to many, because we will invite other organizations to distribute their data on After Eyes. This organi organization can be on the same core business than Mobilia, same territories or not. The only link between all these organizations, it's to keep the 
automotive aftermarket uh, business to be in, in this business for sure because we don't want that co people come from, I don't know, uh, other industry or other sectors come to after rise. At the end, the only point is to be on this industry of automotive. Um, let's say also that um, the solution, our solution, uh, is a 360 degree solution. We have several phases, several um, also, uh, just to explain to you that also on, on your slide, you said that there is different uh, possibility to enter into a data marketplace. We decide to have an onboarding process. So not all people can register as soon as you have the link to the data marketplace, but we select the people who go in. We have a non-boarding, very clear onboarding process on that. And then we have also some other solution inside licensing, subscription, payment solution, and so on. Great. Uh, so what has been the main value that you expect to get from, uh, you know, as After Eyes or, or Mobivia and some of the benefits that the customers will receive? Just also to the value for Mobivia is to create a new line of revenue. So we create also a new line, a new pillar in the data. We have in the past the data for business. And you explained also in, during the presentation that in 19s or 20s, we use the data to understand better the customer, to understand better the market and so on. So we collect data and so on. But then there is a second pillar of this data for business, the data as a business. And we, we create this pillar for sure to reinforce mobility on their market to reinforce Mobilia in terms of revenue and also to, to create a leader on the data exchange in automotive industry. That's the first reason. Let's say that the value also for, for after, for after I, for the company that they come, they come in after I. In fact, we have several company. First company can be data buyer. On the data buyer, it's mostly B2B companies coming from industry can be also insurance, bank, hedge fund. Different company that they want to improve their business by acquire some data. Then we have also another type of company registered on After Eyes is the data provider as Mobilia. And for them, we give to them an access to a data marketplace with many companies allowing data provider to boost their business. They have an immediate access to several players within an ecosystem that is already set up. So it's very important that we have these two lines to, in terms of value and benefit to come in after us. Terrific. So any unique features of the platform you want to talk about? I already said a lot of things on the solution where the 360 degrees approach is easy to use. The solution is very easy to use in a complex market because at the end data is very complex. Then it's also compliance with data regulations such as GDPR, data government acts. That's all the, everything that we, it's in, in Europe, maybe mainly in Europe that maybe in US because I not, don't know the regulation in US, but it's compliance with all this regulation. And maybe the, the, the last point for me, uh, maybe uh, it's just to speak about the future, maybe a little bit, uh, Wayne, uh, because in, in the future, let's say that to be full transparency with you, create value after one year for Mobivia. So it's a success. We are in benefit. So good, good for us, let's say. But then we want to be the leader in Europe. And maybe let's say the sky is the limit. Maybe tomorrow, I don't know, some people come from US, come from Australia, come from, I don't know where, decide to come in After Eyes and maybe to create a, a unique data marketplace <laughs> on the world. Let's say, let's dream in a little bit, you know? But then maybe can it, can it take some time? Let's say that in five years, I'm very glad to be and proud to be the leader in Europe. And yeah, well, what's interesting is when you establish a marketplace, 
you don't know where the ecosystem will take it, right? So yes, it's very exactly. exciting. Yeah. There's yes, all kinds exactly. of innovative solutions. Yeah. yeah exactly. A lot of innovation that will happen on top of the marketplace and outside of it using the data from it. And at the end, the last yeah. word for me, um, if we create, if we, it's, it's going to continue to grow as it's, it's, you know, we have the proof that this works. We would, would like to also to create a business unit separate than Mobilia to operate the data marketplace. Because right now we okay. belong to Mobilia, but maybe tomorrow we don't know. Let's dream a little bit. So they'll spin it off and make you CEO. I like it. <laughs> Ludo, thank you so much for your insights and sharing about uh, After Eyes. Very exciting. Thanks to you. Thanks to you. So now I'd like to uh, introduce Eric Robel, product manager, executive at CoreLogic. Background here. Uh, unlike Mobivia, CoreLogic has always been 100% dedicated to providing data and analytics in their case, to support the U.S. housing market. Uh, CoreLogic maintains the nation's largest database of property and ownership data, which Eric will tell you about, and it collects data from more than 20,000 sources. So it's pretty impressive. A marketplace called the Discovery Platform is a classic seller's hub. Uh, unlike After Eyes, that's starting as a seller's hub and moving to more of an external data marketplace, the Discovery Platform, I think, will always be a seller's hub. And CoreLogic built it to make it easier for data buyers to find, evaluate, and purchase CoreLogic data products. These buyers include real estate professionals, financial institutions, insurance carriers, and government agencies. So I think you'll learn from Eric in the next five minutes or so that the discovery platform, their marketplace, is not your father's data marketplace. It's chock full of innovative features that create a frictionless buying experience. So uh, welcome, Eric. Thanks, Wayne. Great to be here. Why don't you give us a little more background on CoreLogic and what it's doing with the Discovery Platform? Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Wayne. You know, just a little bit, and I think you covered the, the, the background of CoreLogic well, but, you know, we're a leading provider of data analytics and technology to the U.S. housing ecosystem. We like to say that it's the single biggest asset class in the world worth of $40 trillion in, in total sort of real estate assets. We serve a number of verticals within that, um, you know, real estate, um, we've got, you know, technology platforms that serve more than a million real estate agents. We sell data and analytics in that space. Uh, in terms of mortgage and related industries, whether it be capital markets, uh, housing regulators, et cetera, um, you know, deep presence there. Uh, seven of 10 U.S. mortgages are underwritten using CoreLogic technology, and we're selling data through there. Similarly, insurance through our claims business. Um, and then lots of adjacent markets, people are interested in, in, in uh, housing related data. So. You know, again, uh, you know, we, we really know everything there is to know about sort of housing, real estate. Um, we get data from 22,000 sources. We bring that all together. We have 5 billion records going back 50 years, providing sort of a complete view of property. And then we sell to uh, a ton of verticals within the U.S. housing ecosystem and people who are who are interested in, 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 in a view of property. And so we've been selling data for, for decades and, and Discovery Platform is really our way of really transforming how we how we sell data and you kind of cover the old ways of doing it. This is really to, to, to drive a lot of friction out of the process. Yeah, so why don't you yeah. drill down into what the platform is? Yeah, and then, you know, just sort of the uh, the evolution. I mean, I, you think of the, the old way to, the, that we sold data and you kind of covered it up front. The old way of data had a ton of friction, right? Um, we wanted, you know, what we do is, um, uh, if we had a customer interested in our data, we might send over a record layout. Um, if they if they like the record layout, then we go through an evaluation uh, evaluation agreement. You'd have to red line red line to get the lawyers involved. If we could get through that, then we'd pick out just a small snippet of our data, throw it over the wall through FDP, and they would take it and work on it. And so this was a a process very full of friction. And so what we wanted to do is is, is a couple things. I mean, one. Um, sort of consolidate our data assets in one place, but ultimately make that initial evaluation process much, much easier. And so with the discovery platform now, rather than having to do contracting, we do online T's and C's. Uh, we've got this great data exchange where we can see all our data in one place, get data dictionaries, see visualizations, uh, it, it, you know, get you on board in a day with nationwide data sets because it's a secure enclave and we control that secure enclave on our side. I can give you access to every one of our, our, our data products 100% access, all 5 billion records, because it's on our side. So we've got the secure enclave. And I think importantly, um, you know, we've created an environment where 
our data experts can partner with the uh, with the client in a secure analytical space to really sort of accelerate insights. And so we dramatically changed the way that we do data evaluations. We've elevated that client relationship going from really kind of throwing data over the wall to creating that secure space where we can collaborate together. And it's really allowed us to sort of accelerate in for, uh, innovation there. And so we're, you know, we've got sort of a multi-year roadmap. It was really about sort of making a much better evaluation process, but, um, you know, we're creating data products with our clients going forward, but it's it's been, been really transformative of us to, to really do things like Discover in a day. I can give you access to all our data within hours rather than the old way. Yeah, why don't you drill into that? I think that's one of the unique features of your platform is you yeah. create these spaces where the buyer and seller can collaborate and negotiate. That's right. And, and you know, our value prop is, you know, starting with data analytics, we've always had great data analytics. We, we invest a, a ton in our, our data supply chains, 22,000 sources, 5 billion records. Um, but what we've done is we've had that, but now with Discovery Platform, we've made it much more easily discoverable now. And so now, again, you've got a very attractive data change with tiles, visualizations, metadata uh, uh, samples. So we made it much more easily discoverable. Um, we created a platform too, where our clients can upload their own data to our platform. A lot of it'll be, it might be a bank uploading a, a portfolio up to the platform. So now we've got this really great, uh, we've got great data and analytics. Um, we offer try before you buy. So you can come onto the platform, access the complete body of our data. You can try it. And um, if you like it, great. If you don't, then um, th th then that's fine. We're very confident in data. So try before you buy has been, been important. Just get people who might be skeptical, who might be new to buying property data. Uh, like I said, collaboration has been has been great. Um, our data is complicated uh, with our with our sort of our, our analytic spaces uh, workbench. Um, you know, we've created a, a secure environment with all sort of these you know great analytical tools um, um, for our data scientists to partner uh, with uh, with our clients there. And so, a cl great collaboration. You know, talked about Speed Insight. Speed Insight has been transformative here. Again, you sort of can immediately get access to nationwide data sets, and we're going to dramatically reduce the learning curve because we're going to put a data scientist, one of our data scientists, right next to the client to drive through that learning curve and get the insights quickly. And then we've got lots of sort of industry-specific use cases that you can draw on, code that you can draw on so you're not starting from scratch. And so really able to drive that speed in, in, insight. Then ultimately, as, as that insight, as those analytics get created, um, we can automate the task and, and then, then deliver it to any cloud environment. And so that, that's been sort of our value proposition, been very transformative. You know, we're about a year and a half into this journey, but great results so far. Yeah, let's, you know, what's what's unique is that, well, two things, that clip service and then the spaces. So you yep. said your data science, you have a data scientist as a service where they, your data scientists and the customer's data scientists can collaborate in a space inside the marketplace to yep. work out solutions, right? Yeah, and, that, and that's been really transformative. Because like I said, it's, um, you know, before we didn't have that, right? I'd throw over a, a small sample uh, via FTP and they would be left to kind of try to figure things out themselves. Now we've created an environment. Not only do they have all of our data, um, I've got a secure space where literally, you know, you invite our, our team into the space, you can decide who you want to invite, but they can work uh, side by side on code and, and really get the insights faster. Because I mean, you know, with any customer, if we don't get the insights fast, we're going to lose their interest, right? They're, everyone's really busy. We're selling data, we're selling analytics, we're selling insight. And so um, it, it's got to be fast or it, it won't happen. And so that the spaces, the collaboration, driving down the learning curve has been instrumental to get to those insights quick so we can make a sale. And then the clip, the clip service allows people to upload their own data and enrich it yep. with your data using a common link, right? Exactly. And that's important. You know, we we get data from, you know, thousands of different data sources. Um, and so the clip is the core logic of property ID. Um, you know, we've invested a lot of into being able to sort of look at any address in the United States and attach a unique ID to it. Um, you know, deal with all the challenges with address standardization and, and uh, property identification. But again, most of our most of our customers they start with some sort of property based portfolio, or and so upload it. We're going to establish a unique ID, and once we've done that, you've got the keys of the kingdom. All of our data property, all of our data, is has that that clip that intelligent property ID, and so um, that's always the first step. And then it makes joining super easy because 
all that hard work has been done, all of our data assets do have that ID. So it's a quick and easy way for a company to enrich its own data with your data, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Well, Eric, thank you so much for joining us yep. today and sharing your yep. insights. Yep. Okay, so we've got about six minutes to uh, finish up this keynote and I'm gonna focus on the products themselves and share a framework we put together to help you evaluate and select these products. Uh, and the good thing is there are not too many of them yet. <laughs> but when you evaluate a marketplace or what we call data exchange platforms, uh, there's three major areas you wanna look at. You know, a seller studio, how does it facilitate data sellers and acquiring data, standardizing data, packaging that data into products, licensing that data, paying, you know, billing it, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to distributing data. Uh, you know, what's the buyer studio? How easy is it make it for users to find data, evaluate data, define filters so they get exactly what they want, as you heard Eric say, uh, negotiate terms, pay for just what they want, acquire it, ingest it, transform it, and integrate it with their own data. And then for operators, you know, they, you know, use these tools to set up an account plans and payment tier, or pricing tiers, right? And each of those tiers have different options um, and defining those options uh, and how easy it is to do that uh, and enforcing those in the marketplace is something that you want to look at when you're evaluating these products. And also the reporting and monitoring and troubleshooting that's available is really important as well. So I'm not going to go through each of these criteria. Uh, I'm just going to share with you some basic considerations. So for buyers, you might want to ask, you know, does this marketplace support most of the data we need? You know, one-stop shop. Does it deliver raw data, normalized or standardized data, or derived data, or all of that? You probably want all of that, ideally. Um, can you validate data quality, completeness, and compliance? In other words, can the platform do that so you don't have to, right? Because if you don't trust the data, uh, you're not going to buy it, certainly, or use it. You know, can you do more than just download a file? Can you actually run queries and models against the data? Or as Eric was saying, can you share a space with the provider uh, to look at that data and, and maybe run models against it in real time before you even buy? As we said, we saw there, can you upload and enrich your data? For sellers, can you white label the platform so it looks and feels like your own? Does it facilitate commerce inside and outside? Uh, of the platform? Does it support unstructured and semi-structured data? Does it allow sellers and to what degree can they select who can access each product and who cannot? So that's blacklisting and, and whitelisting. Does it support complex licensing and pricing models, uh, multiple distribution methods? Uh, does it support clean rooms? Uh, does it impose fees for cross-region, cross-platform, cross-database sharing. That's something that uh, Snowflake and Databricks are duking out right now. Uh, for operators, is it a SaaS software or is it on-premises software? Does it run on one or multiple clouds? Some run on just one cloud today. I'm sure most of them are trying to expand to others. Uh, does it store the data itself? So in other words, you have to push the data for your products into the marketplace or can the marketplace grab the data where it lies? That's an important architectural distinction. And how do they price um, their products? Can you price it by consumption, by number of products, number of features, or number of organizations supported? And does it offer onboarding templates uh, for both buyers and sellers? So those are some of the basic considerations that you should uh, think about when evaluating the software. So this is a little framework I put together for evaluating the products in the space. And I've talked to a number of folks and everyone agrees it's not easy to create a framework like this, so it's not perfect. But you can see here on the, on the y-axis, there's a buyer hub, seller hub, and then both buyer and seller hub. No one's really one or the other. It's really a matter of the focus of the organization. Are they focused on who are they targeting for sales? Are they focused on the, the sellers or are they focused more on the buyers? Or is it very evenly split? Uh, on the x-axis, is the product platform agnostic? In other words, it can, it can run on any platform. It can store data on any platform. It can work across regions. Or it, are they dependent on a product? 
a cloud platform specifically or uh, has to run in a specific region or has to use a specific cloud data management tool. So this is where I'm putting the vendors right now. Harbor, Narrative, and Revelate tend to focus on selling to data providers and data sellers. Uh, Crux actually doesn't generate a marketplace, but it is very useful in helping data buyers and data sellers ingest external data and, and create and maintain those pipelines. In fact, it started as a managed service and now it's turning that into a SaaS service. Daleks uh, was really good at establishing um, those government, country, regional, municipal uh, marketplaces, but that's not all it does. In fact, all these pure plays will support all four different types of marketplaces that I went through earlier. Uh, and Informatica is focused today on internal data marketplaces only. And then on the other side, you've got the platform dependent players, Databricks, Google, Microsoft, Snowflake, and usually somewhere in the mix, you have to use their product for something. Although Databricks has uh, recently announced and is shipping uh, open source Delta sharing product. That's a protocol that uh, works with Delta tables, which itself is open source and can um, move data between any cloud platform uh, region and data management system. So right here, I've written uh, you know, very short snippets on what the key differentiators of each product is. I'm not gonna go through each of these. When we produce the data marketplace report that Kevin mentioned at the outset, that'll come out in January. It'll have deeper profiles on each of these products. So look for that. But this gives you a sense of what some of the, the, the real key differentiator, what separates them from the pack. So uh, that really is the end of my presentation. And you don't wanna miss the panel. That's it for now. And uh, I'll see you in five minutes. Okay, we're back. Hope everyone had a quick, break and uh, really looking forward to this discussion now. So thank you, Wayne. Great discussions. And um, I think in terms of the panel, I wanted to quickly introduce our panelists. Um, Didier Naves is Senior Vice President of Strategy and Alliances at DAWX. We have Ian Gilbert, who is CEO of Revelate, and Ian Stahl, Senior Director of Product Management at Informatica. Well, great. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, okay. yeah, we have a great panel here and we want to make this a collaborative discussion. So Eric Robel is here from our keynote, me and Kevin here. So first question to the panel, uh, DDA, Ian, and Ian, <laughs> you know, what do you think is the market potential here? I obviously built it up quite a bit. Uh, the fourth generation data architecture, the missing component of uh, data mesh. Uh, but what do you guys think? Anyone can jump in. Go ahead, Didier. Okay. Uh, well, actually, the, the potential is, is huge. Really, what we, as practitioner, we observe on the market uh, really confirms that what you could call globally the data economy is really maturing fast. And, and data marketplace will have in play role in support that trend. Just to illustrate that a little bit, if we just look at the number of RFPs, RFIs that are issued today all around the world, I'm talking really all around the world, it's amazing. It's really taking off. Uh, we were invited this year by uh, the World Economic Forum to speak at Davos, and there were five sessions on the topic of data exchange. Uh, so really this topic has reached the boardrooms of corporations and country leaders are talking about it. So it's really, and if you add other trends, like uh, if you look at the work done by the regulators, uh, the industry, uh, the data, everything related to data exchange is, is becoming more and more regulated. It's also accelerating with new piece of regulations that's going on and it's, it's going to continue like that. Uh, people are working, hundreds of organizations uh, putting them together and put some efforts in defining new reference architecture for data exchange. Thinking in Europe, for example, with Gaia X, or, and there are also standardization initiatives. So all these signals tells that the topic is, 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 is there and, and there to stay. And, and data marketplace will play a, a very big role into that as it will create those, um, and it is creating those trusted secure plays where those data can be exchanged and data can circulate. So it's, from our perspective, 
it's it's big in terms of the opportunity, the market, and and it's here to stay. So let's turn that I'll, over I'll to, to that. Ian. Yeah. yeah, you guys, Ian and Ian, you have different perspectives because Ian, you know, Stahl, internal marketplaces at Informatica, Ian Gilbert, external seller hubs at mm -hmm. uh, Revelate. So what do you guys think? That's true. Well, I, I, I might go first, uh, Ian Gilbert, and, and just say that, uh, you know, Informatica, of course, a market leading provider of data management infrastructure and technologies uh, for global 2000 companies. And I would say that uh, seconding what Didier says about the potential upside of this market, I think this is a dynamic that we've been seeing quite a bit, which is um, what's often driving the customer's IT spend around data management technologies is some imperative to be able to uh, minimize the cost associated with uh, managing data management technologies and infrastructure and the IT costs associated with it. Um, this uh, can manifest in a number of ways. I think a big one that um, Informatica has been focused on really over the last five years is the migration to the cloud and the leveraging of public cloud infrastructure and past infrastructure to be able to support data management uh, technologies at scale. And then um, the particular vector that I've come to it, Wayne, was from data governance. As you know, we've had several discussions previously about the criticality of data governance to be able to provide a meaningful basis for data sharing and for data self-service. I would say that historically, I think one aspect of, of data governance is that um, organizations' um, impetus to invest in data governance has been, I might characterize it as all stick and no carrot. Right, so they're compelled to provide to, to perform some sort of data governance function to meet some sort of regulatory outcome or something like that, right? But this uh, concept of like being data sharing and this idea that they might be able to monetize those investments and get some return on those investments is very compelling to a lot of chief data officers and other executive stakeholders that are driving these investments. Finally, they can see some upside for this. And it's not all about cost uh, mitigation or risk reduction. There's actually a return on investment sitting on the other side of this. Um, we're focused on the internal side, enabling organizations to be able to get the most value out of their data by leveraging it for their insights and things like that. But I mean, turning it over to Ian Gilbert, I would say that also in terms of data exchange and data sharing uh, inter-organizationally, uh, there's plenty of upside there too. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. probably is. I think we'll, we'll 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 probably get to that in a while, and I I, I want to get back to the question because I think there's something poignant at the heart of it. When you're asking if, if this is going to grow and if there's massive market potential, I, I look behind the curtains. You asked us a sub question: Is this architecture or fad? And it's probably neither, in my opinion. But look, mm. it's five years now since Doug Laney and Gartner wrote Infonomics and sort of codified at least a thought process around data monetization internally and externally five years. So do we agree that data sharing and more importantly, data use for monetization amongst multiple audiences is going to be big? I think we can all agree that. The danger is, five years on from knowing this was true anyway, the danger is in our search for architecture, we miss something that Ian referenced there quite poignantly. And that is the business value that data users or data consumers need and demand, and that will drive market scale. And we miss the point that data consumers on the whole, we think anyway, are probably not going to be data experts. If I can be hyperbolic, they don't really want data. They want the insights and the business decisions that data can provide them. And they want simplicity, breadth of access, of engagement, and they want it to be fulfilled really, really simply at scale. So like every other market that's ever existed, it's our customers, the users of data who are going to drive the scale. If you think about the conversations we've had so far today, in the keynote, I thought it was a terrific keynote, but here we are uh, talking about how we're going to architect the ecosystem to supply all this stuff. When do we start asking ourselves what do consumers want? And when do we make the assumption that consumers, honestly, they don't really care about data? So architecture or fad, probably neither. Vital business process associated with massive amounts of potential business uh, business value, whether or not you do it internally or externally, and we can argue later about whether we re really are only externally and seller focused, but that's a different conversation. Uh, the user that counts, I, and there are there are other markets we can patent to drive growth here that I think could be more educative for us than we realize in all of our data expertise and cleverness. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so, what do you, uh, DDA and, and Ian Stahl? What do you think customers are looking for out there? 
maybe I'll take a stab at that. Uh, so I'd say that, um, so one thing is that, um, you know, just being Informatica and being a supplier of tech, of data exchange platform technologies, I guess to, to coin the phrase from the keynote, Wayne, um, what I would say is that um, we're cognizant of the fact that uh, our buyer is not necessarily the data consumer or is almost definitely not the data consumer, right? And in fact, actually conforms more to the persona you described as the data marketplace operator and mm-hmm. that um, they need to be able to provide a platform for the exchange of data between producers and consumers uh, with the highest possible scale and efficiency at the lowest possible cost. And uh, to that degree, then we're leveraging the infrastructure. And I would point out particularly uh, the capabilities in the Informatica data management cloud that facilitate metadata management and the availability of that metadata to support data data access and data delivery um, are very key, I think, to our solution approach to be able to defriction uh, that exchange of data between producers and consumers on that platform. But that being said, I think that uh, you can make that as seamless and frictionless as possible. I think the critical thing that you really need to make this work is you have to, the, the, the interaction with the marketplace that the consumer has with the marketplace has to be as easy to use as possible. And I was struck by something, um, Eric, that you mentioned in in the keynote earlier about uh, these uh, kind of collaboration spaces that you built into the discovery platform that facilitate interactions with data scientists. Uh, I think that's actually a, an incredibly like intuitive and kind of interesting idea, right? This idea that um, actually one of the things that makes it possible for consumers to understand uh, and and trust uh, the data that they're accessing using is the opinions of their peers, the other data scientists, the other analysts in their organization. And if your platform, your marketplace platform can facilitate that type of peer-to-peer collaboration, it's gonna go a long way towards addressing many of those concerns about data understandability um, and, data, and, and data trust. Okay. Maybe go ahead, Didier, yeah. Address the point. Uh, first of all, Dawex, uh, we, we're providing uh, technology uh, solutions for operating uh, data, data exchange, data marketplace, data hub. And we, we're talking with organizations in, in many different industry sectors, private, public sector. Uh, but generally, we, we always speak with, uh, to, to business people. It's, business, it's a, business, a business conversation uh, that, that, we, that we're having. And the reason, which was your question about what, what those organizations we, we're working with and we're speaking with are looking for, really depends, can be very, very different. If you're talking with a representative from the government uh, of a government initiative, or if you're speaking with a retailer, uh, it's completely different conversation. But basically it can be, uh, as Ludovic uh, was from Afterwise was saying, is finding new revenue streams for the data, their data. Uh, so when an organization, you know, someone quote uh, Lene, uh, someone when someone from an organization organization realized that uh, data is is an asset actually that has a high value and that can be of interest to others who might want to pay for having access to that data, that can be a, a reason why they're looking for implementing data exchanges or data marketplace. Uh, it can be for simply st- uh, streamlining uh, data sourcing. When you are acquiring lots of data from outside sources, you want to streamline that process. Uh, but it can be more global, building partnerships with different companies around uh, data exchange, data sharing for certain specific goals. Uh, or sometimes it's just that you, you see as an organization the opportunity to position yourself at the center of an ecosystem and provide data exchange services to multiple organizations in a many-to-many situation. Um, and there are also other reasons, but maybe not the prime reason, but it's uh, also very interesting to see that uh, it may have an impact on the brand equity of an organization and and even its company valuation. I think it's Doc Laney that uh, was mm-hmm. uh, uh, supporting some, some, some survey and studies saying that a data savvy or data product company are, are, are valued higher from a financial perspective than uh, organizations uh, in the same industry, uh, but not that with not that profile. So number of reasons, and of course, it can be uh, several reasons put together. It can even change over time. At Afterrise, they started with 
as a one-to-many uh, approach uh, with their data, selling it to others, and then putting themselves in the shoes of an orchestrator or an operator of an exchange inviting multiple organizations. So many different reasons. And uh, yeah, so uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all. So can I just add something? Sure. Yeah. Because I, I think again we've done it again. So so we asked what customers are interested in, and and definitely like my colleagues here, we spend most of our time talking to and selling directly to data owners, provider sellers, those kind of things. Those are the people we talk to, um, and definitely when we're talking with them, look what we could do for them is all very interesting. But there's a start point, isn't there, around their current state, their maturity, which is one aspect we look at, and the extent to which these organizations are already already have a bias for either data externalization or sharing that's a cultural bias that you can assess in the current businesses as it is today and and too, too few times we're stopping and asking what's your current state so therefore what what is the journey you can go on as a data owner or a provider we assume add marketplace or similar buzzwords and we'll all be good but there's a flip side to this 95 percent of the organizations we're talking to the data owner issue is a data consumer problem they're trying to solve. So again, we're not selling directly, and, and neither of my colleagues, to data consumers, but, but like any other asset or product class, the fundamental underlying problem, whether you're sharing data internally or externally, is a data consumer problem. And in that environment, data consumers are a very important stakeholder in a conversation about the architectures we put in place to provide. I, I spent the evening with a, with a client in the financial services industry in New York two days ago, and the entire dialogue they wanted to have was how, about the, all, all the fuss on LinkedIn about people testing chat GPT and understanding how they can use natural language and, 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 and speech work to create an entry point to their data sharing initiatives. Again, that perspective from data consumers in an aggregate form is the heart and the solution to understanding how we should act and, and what, what we should provide to, to data providers. As the old saying goes, something can't be a solution if it doesn't solve a problem. And too often, we're in danger of creating things, calling them solutions, but they don't do anything. And we've got to get, again, the data consumer and, and their experience, their accessibility and user experience at the heart of what we do. Excellent. Uh, Sorry, so I, we, we've talked a, a lot about what customers need. The purpose of this event really is to help customers evaluate products, select products, and then implement them successfully. So if we drill down a little bit, what features should people really be looking at? I think we've mentioned you know, uh, the ability to collaborate you know, on the platform. We talked about metadata, Ian, you talked about that. And, and I, I bet, mm -hmm. you know, your ability to convert a catalog into a data product, uh, interesting feature. So what do you guys think are the, the key things that customers who are in the audience should be looking at today? Do you mind if I start on this one, guys? Sure, please do. Go for it, Ian. Just going around, Robin. So, so look, I, I, I didn't position us in the first place. And, and, and just to sort of, uh, just to frame the answer a little bit, uh, the late, Positions a data fulfillment platform is what we call it. So we're helping organizations, frankly, who are managing both data sharing internal problems and data commercialization and sales external problems, um, designed to be integrated into a data ecosystem. But our focus is, you know, how do you prepare, package, distribute data, but most importantly, from anywhere to anyone. So there are a number of table stakes requirements that the data marketplace or store uh, uh, technology would need, but we would argue most technologies need. And, and, and I'm sure we're going to cover ground on, on good governance uh, and appropriately secure, appropriate security protocols, the need for effective cataloging, uh, and those aspects of a solution. I'd say they're table stakes for every organization out there. Uh, again, connecting the dots to the user desires that are out there. Uh, our position would be that accessibility, usability, uh, and the features that are related to things like transactional management, whether it's internal or external, even if you're not selling data, you're still probably in a business that has cross-charging protocols and embedded ERP systems that you need to integrate properly with. The distribution from anywhere to anywhere, whether they're using an established data management tool or whether they're using Microsoft Excel or if they want some other cut, those are critical components of functionality that put power into the user's hands. And then the entire flow, the extent to which you're mimicking, I don't know, the Shopify's of this world to create really rich, um, elegant consumer experiences. That's where we think internal or external providers 
should and could uh, looking at the core functionality. And I mean, I think core logic uh, this morning was a very good example of that. Look at the elegance of that position solution. That's a consumer friendly solution that differentiates it greatly, even though you've got to achieve the, stable ta uh, the table stakes elements. Agreed. I think I, mean, I would add to what Ian said in terms of this, those core capabilities, uh, any, any data sharing platform or data exchange platform would need. I guess I would say that uh, for us, a critical factor of it is uh, that ability to uh, have uh, to be able to source data from any of a number of different uh, environments or different ecosystems. I, I think one of the key issues for us is that um, every customer that Informatica serves with our intelligent data management cloud by definition ha is is not in a doesn't have like a clean data stack they all have some sort of kind of shared set of repositories maybe it's a kind of hybrid cloud where they have some legacy on premise uh, data warehouse that they're they haven't been in a position to retire maybe their ambition is to retire it someday right but there's too many mission critical uh, mission critical analytics that's actually happening to be able to support that right in the meantime they may have spun up uh, you know Football pass subscriptions to be able to support various initiatives. And then they're confronted with this situation where they have effectively replicated on the cloud a, a data estate that's at least as complicated as the one they previously had, had on premise, maybe even more complicated in certain ways. Uh, and that they need to be able to rationalize that to be able to obtain uh, that data. But th they can't, you know, boil the whole ocean, right? They need some guidance as to sort of what they should focus on and what they should prioritize in terms of accelerating data uh, migration into um, their modern cloud cloud environments, into their cloud ecosystem to be able to make that available. And one area that I think actually helps that is, in fact, the marketplace. Because what the marketplace does is signal data demand from their consumer base, right? It is a channel by which you can infer which data has latent value and which data does not. And then you can focus your scarce data stewardship, data curation, data management, uh, uh, resources and functions on optimizing that data, that, you, know, you know, that corpus of data product. And then you can grow your footprint over time from there while you're accelerating adoption of your marketplace. Right, because the more data that's high value on the marketplace that your consumers are consuming, the more consumption will have. So it's a, there's sort of like a multiplier effect associated with that. And then I think the last one I would say, just to reinforce the point I made earlier about Eric's uh, spaces, is collaboration. I think that the marketplace, you know, really benefits from the sort of social dimension of it. And I think one important, uh, one important insight I think that we had with uh, the marketplace offering that we fielded on the cloud, which you know, honestly, isn't is is about the same. Um, uh, you know, is is really a little bit, just a little bit more than a year old, right? Is um, that uh, often the thing that 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 this kind of social space for data sharing? exists before the marketplace ever starts up. Actually, the, the, in fact, actually in the absence of any kind of marketplace or any formal mechanism for being able to, to self-serve for data, the way people find data in their organizations is they go to people who know. And those people go to people who know. And then that's actually, it's those social networks that actually secure how data, that, that data, they're foundational to the data economy. So the marketplace can account for that and subsume that. That's gonna make adoption of the marketplace experience much more, much you know, much more frictionless than it would be if you were replacing existing processes. Yeah, so I want to I want to go to Didier uh, because you mentioned something earlier that struck me, um, or it may in Ludo, but uh, it's the fact that your platform or any platform who is doing a marketplace should help the players uh, certify the data that it complies with regulatory standards. And I'm wondering if you see that yeah. as a key element for consumers. Yes, uh, it is actually a key element, but I would say that uh, actually uh, DAWX we've always focused since inception of the company in building solutions that are the more complete from uh, in terms of coverage, so really having a 360% coverage on everything that relates to data exchange. And uh, that includes a number of elements. Obviously, I would say there could be probably four or five pillars. 
um, you have the, everything that relates to the technical exchange of the data so that the data can be exchanged in different fashions, um, file-based, API-based, in, in a managed mode, in, in, a, in a distributed mode. There are different mechanisms that, 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 are, that are possible. That's one thing, but that's not enough. It's also everything about the business aspects and the, the, the licensing elements. So data are being exchanged and shared under certain terms and conditions that can be negotiated, that can be uh, very um, specific or standard for different transactions. It can relate to uh, open data licenses, commercial licenses. There are different mechanisms of pricing for the data. So this layer is essential. There is also the, the business model uh, behind a marketplace that needs to be managed and operate. So because if a government sets up in, in place a data exchange environment or, or a data hub, it will operate in a certain way from, I would say, a business perspective versus another organization we will do differently. How they're going to monetize and generate uh, financial sustainability, I would say, of, a, of the marketplace? Uh, are they going to... Um, the operator going to charge an access fee to the marketplace? Is it going to take a commissions on the transactions that are taking place on it or a, or a combination of that? Or is it going to put a uh, free access to the, to the marketplace, whatever it choose? It needs to be managed. So that's, the, I would say, the business model behind. And last but not least, and that was the point that you were mentioning, it's all, also about compliance. Uh, data is being, uh, exchange of data is being regulated more and more. And it's important not only for the data providers, uh, but also the operators to be complying with these new regulations. Uh, data providers typically will be, it will be important to address the aspects of personal uh, PIs. Um, and there are different regulations, GDPR in Europe and number of regulations around the world now, a number of them also being aligned now. But you also you have now regulations that are coming in uh, on the role of those intermediaries, uh, which are the data exchange uh, operators. And that's, for example, the Data Governance Act in Europe, and also uh, a certain type of data exchange will be regulated also uh, through the future, it's just proposed now in Europe, the Data Act, which is, for example, addressing the specific topic of uh, smart devices data uh, and the accessibility of those data uh, for those who want to use it, especially the product, the smart product users or even third parties. So it's all these elements which brings a complexity in certain way that need to be addressed by, by a marketplace. And the end result of that, the role of the marketplace, and that's key also in the way we are designing our solution, is that it needs to provide and increase a level of trust. Uh, trust among the participants, trust um, among the marketplace. If you don't have trust, then it's too much friction for, for transactions to really uh, uh, develop the, and, and data to be exchanged. So trust is addressed uh, through a different manner. We as a, a product developer, um, we are we're putting a number of features that help increase trust. The regulator is working on regulation, not for slowing down innovations and transactions, but uh, rather the opposite is actually bringing trust on the market because uh, if you don't have uh, legal cl clarity, it's also a friction point for those who might potentially share their data, but they don't do it because they don't know exactly what, uh, what the impact is uh, from a more legal and regulatory perspective. So number of elements. So yeah. for us, functional mm -hmm. coverage is key, uh, flexibility, uh, number of governance tools for the operators, uh, that's uh, that's key element to to take into consideration when choosing the solution. Great. So I think um, Eric, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yep. Awesome. Okay. So we've been asking vendors what customers want from these uh, data marketplace tools, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering, from a practitioner perspective, since you have three captive vendors here, what would you say that uh, <laughs> they should be providing to the marketplace to meet your needs? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think uh, I agree with a lot of what everyone's saying. I mean, you know, first of all, you know, people don't care about data, they care about insights. And so um, first thing is trying to create a frictionless way to get to insights quickly. And that's what we're trying to do to be able just to get people
people on the platform very quickly, um, create a great shopping experience that can discover all the data, uh, easy way to sort of upload data, um, but ultimately, you know, a, a, an analytical space with, with all, you know, all the tools that someone would want, R, SQL, uh, Python, et cetera, a, a way to collaborate. It's just all about getting the insights quickly. And so there's friction in the process. Our data consumers are just going to drop off. And so when we've had friction, they drop off, they lose interest. So it's just create a platform that is frictionless for onboarding, for discovering data, for creating a se secure space to collaborate. Um, and, and then, you know, and then the thing we're working on now is continuing to improve the user experience while they're on platform. So sort of everything from speed of queries, uh, to code sharing, things like that. And all it's all under a frictionless way to get the insights quickly. And so that's what, you know, and then what we're trying to do now, that's sort of, a lot of what we're doing now is really more the data science persona, but now we're trying to create prepackaged use case. So you don't have to write code anymore. Just, you know, industry by industry, click, 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 and you get an insight, but that's it. Frictionless, uh, frictionless, fast insight is what customers want. Wow. Serverless, serverless, uh, serving up the, uh, Insights on demand through serverless technology. Yeah, exactly. People don't care about the platform, the data, the tools. They, they want insight. They want it fast. They want it frictionless. And and if we don't do that, then they're just going to lose interest and be like, eh, I got other things to do. So. <laughs> Ian Gilbert, you were about to say something. Oh, I was. Yeah, I was. Sorry, I was. I was misrunning my panel contribution. I liked a lot of what Didier said and, and wanted to sort of endorse and agree on the compliance side. And just because I know we have a bunch of CDOs on this on this call, I was going to just try and make a practical point. There's some great vendors out there like Amuta and others who do great specialized work in this area of compliance and governance, are significant partners for the Databricks and Snowflakes of this world. And I was just going to comment that I think, it, A, Didier is right, B, I think you've probably got another session you could run on that one area that could include those kind of participants. There's some terrific companies out there. I think another dimension uh, to Didier's point I would probably draw on is also, and I think feel like this is something that we see coming back from the, um, the operator constituency, right, is um, a need for observability over the distribution of data. Um, this often gets articulated uh, in this kind of very kind of IT-centric catalog -y way around something like a, a requirement for lineage, Right. But it's almost like what you need is the lineage that forecasts the distribution of the data. And that actually is the is, is the requirement that they need. And um, so I, I frame it more in terms of observability. And then off of that is a number of things around sort of like what's the impact quality? What's the impact to availability? Things like that. Um, I'd say observability is sort of a super term that encompasses the flow of data and the impact of the of the flow of data on the consumer's usage of it. And I think the I think the point that Eric made about frictionlessness, if that's a word, mm -hmm. um, is a really key one. I, I, it, Wayne, I, I know there are parts of the questions you were going to ask about what does the future hold three to five years. I'll tell you, like watch the way the retail industry went in the first place. Forget data for a second and just watch how omnichannel played out. Don't forget that Amazon was a bookshop. Don't forget that Shopify yeah. sold snowboards, and don't forget how they evolved, and don't forget how that market is now nested. So if I want to buy. I don't, I'm an old man, but if I want to buy Lego, I might do that on the Amazon store. Um, but I'm going to the Lego store first to understand the community and the options. And I might wander into the shopping mall and go to the real Lego store and talk to some Lego people. And to Ian Starr's point earlier, I'm going to engage in the Lego community. Our chief product officer is a massive Lego nerd, and he's on all sorts of social media sites about Lego that he then translates into his buying experience I, I promise you, we're going to go the same way. And, and that's why we keep preaching this data consumer message, because, yeah, we need all of that underlying thoughtful architecting. But at the end of the day, frictionlessness, elegance and ease of the experience and the nested nature of marketplaces plus stores, plus social network and other forms, that's where consumers are going to take us. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, data Wait, marketplace, it's not just a metaphor. Here from... Uh... Wait. From the audience yeah. as well. Yeah, let's hear from. We have about. Uh, we'll, we'll be generous and give us three or four more minutes left. Uh, so okay. let's take a question from the audience, Kevin. Okay, we had a couple. I, I, I'll prioritize here. As you look at the next eighteen to twenty-four months, how do you rank the following factors that can impact your growth? Data owner demand, access to data talent, which everyone's looking for, simplicity of delivering value, and data standardization. 
that was quite a list. <laughs> so we'll let that, we'll, we'll leave that open as to who wants to tackle first. I'd go, I'll rank them. I'd go value, uh, owner demand, talent, the fourth one was. Standardization. Uh, standardized, yeah. standardization. I just don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> Although I, I do think that standardization is an issue that eventually, um, uh, you know, we're, that that it would could could drive some in industry, uh, you know, some sort of industry consensus or something like that. And I, you know, I'm responding to your point about earlier, like the direction of the retail market, right? And retail market does have standards for data interchange, like Global Sync and things yeah, like yeah. that, right? There isn't a corresponding right. sort of interchange format like that for data. I know uh, Databricks positions Delta Share in that way. We interoperate with consume Delta share uh, data shares uh, for transmissibility, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But I think there is sort of an opening there. I, I definitely I agree with you, Ian. I wouldn't characterize data standardization as the key issue, but I think as we start to scale out data interchange, the need for standardization around data interchange formats and particularly metadata format standardization will become more and more pronounced over time. Uh, I think that's something that we're going to see. I don't disagree. I think the proxy in the short term will be, you know, transparent methods or invisible methods to fake it in the background. But, yeah, but I, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right in the long term. Maybe I would like just a quick comment on the on the, on the data talent. Uh, it, I think when data are going to, there will be more circulation of data and exchange of data. Uh, there are new types of talents that that will be needed. New new roles. Uh, a, a data monetizer. Uh, hedge funds have, have data sourcing specialists. They have that, 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 that role. But data monetizer, data product management, it's a, packaging a data product requires marketing skills, like any kind of product management function. Mm -hmm. um, so product marketing, data product marketing, data product management, data monetizer. Uh, we talked about regulation. Data compliance, data exchange compliance specialists. These are important roles that will be required that add to the roles that we all know. Those who are actually turning those data into insights, uh, the uh, the data analysts, the data scientists. But there's the other the other element. When I was talking about those uh, 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 pillars, uh, there's obviously the circulation and exchange of data, but then there's the, all these business-related elements and uh, possibly legal and regulatory element also. Didier, you got the last word because we're out of time, but thank you, Didier, Ian, and Ian, and Eric for your contributions. A pleasure, Very interesting. Okay, Here we are. We're live again. Wayne and I are back and have some takeaways we can talk through. Yeah, I think that what's interesting is that there's so many types of organizations that can find value in data marketplaces. I was, uh, I've was i been really struck at the, the range of public sector organizations, cities, other governmental entities, and then within the private sector. I think really across verticals, there are more and more types of enterprises that can gain a lot of value from uh, actively sharing data and creating marketplaces for buyers and sellers. Um, also, the range of domains, I think, will only increase, especially as organizations adopt more and more data science cases. Yeah, and it's it's really we're just at the beginning as companies discover how plug and play these technologies are. I think you'll see a lot more companies starting data marketplaces in their area, their sector. It says big ecosystems think big and be creative about the types of parties that might find value in a yes. given data set. Thank you. Yeah, so I think um, the the range of ecosystems that can contribute data sets or potentially consume it. I think building on the first point, it's not just the types of companies that can benefit from participating, but also the types of companies that might uh, ultimately consume data through other types of um, exchanges after it's on the marketplace. Pretty rich e ecosystem and a lot of opportunities there. Yeah, you know, and I think the thing is, it's, I'm not sure what the right word is, but it's, it's like this, you get all these different players together in one place where it's simple, to communicate and collaborate, it, it can create this huge synergy, right? That can generate things that no one anticipated could happen. But by bringing all these folks together in a frictionless environment, I think it's gonna be a huge amount of innovation that comes out of these ecosystems. Definitely. 
And it'll be very interesting to see, um, just to build on that point briefly, what the conversation is a year from now. When we do a tech fan on this topic in 16 months, 18 months, to what degree is data science playing a role there? Because there are so many types of artifacts that you can start to create and share, machine learning algorithms and so forth, to take advantage of this stuff. So a lot of opportunity. Um, the third item here is big requirements. Wayne's got, I think, some more detailed thoughts on the, the key evaluation criteria. I think frictionless sharing is a theme that came up again and again, um, and the need to enrich and delight the consumer experience. Couldn't agree more with some of the panelists' conversations uh, or comments on the need to ultimately deliver value to consumers, the folks who are taking advantage of the data, beyond yeah. simply uh, creating a marketplace. Yeah, wholeheartedly agree. Okay. All right, number four. Okay, social, social networks, networks contribute to the value of data marketplaces by engaging many network, many users. Yeah, and I think that um, the more you can leverage that as a, as a participant in a marketplace, the better. There are so many different ways to engage people these days. You'll really want to tap into existing methods of, uh, of exchanging information and ideas. And uh, folks who, who contribute to their networks and bring them into exchanges, I think will create even more value. Yeah, yeah. The panel said that, that marketplaces essentially formalize these social networks and, and, and probably turbocharge them. Very much. Uh, number five, marketplaces should leverage these networks, social networks, rather than trying to supplant them. Okay. Yeah, and I think it's building on the first point. Uh, you know, yeah. the, the, the notion is that you, the, you want to tap into existing methods of, that organizations have to interact with each other. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Six, data marketplaces should start with internal users, demonstrate value, then go external. I, I think that will, will definitely happen, not in all cases, for sure. Like after eyes, it's going right to an external yeah. data marketplace, right? But um, I think a lot of companies have to experiment and work out the legal and security issues about sharing data across organizational boundaries, you know? before they participate in these things. Yep, agreed. And, and I think that you, you, you want to have sort of a test case, a sandbox where you're working out some of the kinks before you go broad. Yeah. And I think uh, I have one final point here. Yeah. Yeah, so I was struck looking at your framework, Wayne. I think that um, data marketplaces are going to want to tap the broadest range of potential parties to engage with in the broadest ecosystem. And so all the uh, marketplaces that are focused on one platform are the big platform owners, the ones that already have incredible scale, Snowflake, Databricks, and so forth. If you're going to be a pure play marketplace, I think an evaluation criteria to make sure that they're reaching the right folks is that they're more pl platform agnostic. Yeah, I think, you know, Amazon was the first data platform vendor to establish a data marketplace. And now everyone feels all of their direct competitors in the data management and cloud space feel compelled to, to match them. But from what I'm hearing, you know, companies who, the data providers who want to create a, you know, enriched data storefront like CoreLogic did, they're going to turn to the, the specialty vendors. Um, and, and companies that have products, they may put them on the tech vendor marketplaces kind of for marketing purposes. But they really want to push people to their own storefronts to actually do deals, right? So I think that's an interesting dynamic. See if that plays out. Yeah. So Wayne, I think you've got some takeaways here as well that we can go to. I do. Uh, and before I mention some of them, there's one trend I forgot, but uh, in talking with Ian Stahl in, from Informatica in his booth, he kind of touched on it the importance of metadata. He sees a lot of their marketplace customers coming from the data governance space and they've built a data catalog and then they're like, okay, now what? How do we make this actionable? We got all this metadata, we spent all this time and effort, but it's just metadata. So the way to actionable, make a catalog actionable is to turn it into a data marketplace or at least take be able to take the assets from the catalog and turn them into products that you can publish in the marketplace. So that's a trend I'm gonna to add to my presentation. We and actually got... had an interesting conversation about metadata 
we have found a, an avid reader of Jay's recent blogs on metadata in our uh, in the Eckerson Group uh, lounge table. So me oh, metadata is something. Yeah. Oh, okay. Someone's going down that rabbit hole with Jay, huh? <laughs> yes, he was thrilled to find it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one key. These are all from the panel. So Ian Gilbert said the key is to focus on the business value for data consumers, not data monetization. I think you kind of emphasize that in your points on the previous slide. Yeah. It's all about the consumer and the value provided to them, not the money. <laughs> Although we had a little bit, I guess, a contrary opinion, uh, which we'll get to in a second. So Didier uh, Navez from Docs said data marketplaces require new roles like data monetizer, data productizer, data compliance specialist. And I think that's so true. We're working with a client now that is a prime candidate for a data marketplace. And they, they're kind of resource constrained, it's a government entity, but they're gonna need people who specialize in creating those data products, even though they're really easy to do, but someone's gotta look after that or at least train the data, the people who actually create the, the raw data, how to do it themselves. So I do think there are going to be new roles. Let's see, next one. Data management is all stick, no carrot. Uh, this is from Ian Stahl, Informatica. Data marketplaces change that equation and deliver ROI. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really hard to govern your data, right? It's just no, no one really gets excited about attending the data governance meeting. But all of a sudden, when you productize data, you by default have to govern it, right? And by publishing data products, there's all kinds of benefits that can accrue, ROI being one of them. And I think uh, Didier mentioned some others below here. Uh, I thought it was a good quote from Ian Gilbert of Revel A. Data consumers want insights and simplicity, not data. It's like, duh, yeah, you're right. You know? I think he was kind of, uh, criticizing me for focusing on fourth generation architecture, right? I think his corollary here was, it's not about the architecture. It's not even about the data. It's about the insights that the data drives. And our goal as technologists is to make it as easy and simple as possible for, for people to get those insights. Yeah, I agree. And it actually plays to Ian's first point there, which is uh, focusing on uh, data consumers and making sure they're getting the value they need. Right. There's always the tendency to uh, view data as good in its own right and share it for the sake of sharing it. Oh, okay. And here's the Didier quote. It's not just about ROI. It's about strengthening partnerships, cultivating ecosystems, fostering trust. And Dallas does, Dallas does a good job doing all those things with their customers. <clears throat> all right. Number six, data marketplaces need to deliver an exquisite customer experience like Shopify. So that was from Ian Gilbert. We already talked about that. Uh, so this was interesting, you know, from Informatica, Ian said, our buyer isn't the data consumer or even the data seller, it's the data operator. And I think that's probably true for, I don't know, like CoreLogic, they do kind of, they're a seller hub, so they do a hub, right? But their focus is, yeah, I guess their focus is the consumer, you know? So uh, that's what made it a little bit difficult to put together that framework is that there's actually three different constituencies in this market with very different requirements and needs. Okay, I think this is the last. Our data marketplace needs to engender trust in data. Okay, that's from Didier. We already talked about that. And I think that's it, Kevin, right on time. All right. Uh, Everyone comes to our next tech event on modern data pipelines that Kevin Petrie will be the keynoter uh, in running that show. And then we've got these other events in 2003, one on data intelligence. That's kind of like metadata management, data cataloging, active metadata. And then in August, data mesh and data fabric. And then finally in December, data observability. So with that, Kevin, any last words? No, great topic. As I said, I'll be thrilled to see what the CDO tech fan conversation is like in 18 months to see how the industry evolves. Role of data science, 
and, and, and the degree to which we can have governed data products, it'll be a very interesting set of developments over the next 18 months. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. If you've lasted this long, we give you all kinds of gold stars. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.